Okay, everyone, welcome to the Vantage Seminar on this beautiful fall day. And we're still in this fourth series of talks about points on elliptic curves. And today we're very happy to have Wei Ho speaking on integral points on elliptic curves. And so take it away. Um, thank you, Rachel. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, so today, um, I'm going to be live writing my talk. Um, there are notes posted uh, that I think Drew will be sharing. Um, so if you prefer to follow along there, those are, that's roughly what I will be following as I write my talk, but hopefully this will make it a little bit more digestible as I go. Um, okay, so um, today I'm gonna to be talking about questions related to thinking about integral points on elliptic curves, which is maybe a little bit different than some of the things we've thought about so far in this series of uh, talks. Um, but it will very much use the ideas that uh, we've seen about uh, ranks of elliptic curves and rational points on elliptic curves. So um, I'll start um, by just talking about what I mean by an elliptic curve today. So I have an E uh, and I'm going to denote it EAB. Um, sometimes I'll just call it E when it's obvious. Um, so this is going to be the elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. And for most of today, I mean, I'll, we'll just work over the rational numbers. So A and B will be uh, just rational numbers. And of course, we need the discriminant here. So the discriminant, maybe I'll call it delta AB. Again, I, will, uh, take, I won't write down the AB always if it's obvious, um, just for simplicity. Um, so this is negative 16 for A cubed plus 27B squared. This had better be non-zero in order for this to be an elliptic curve. Okay. So this gives us an elliptic curve in short Weierstrass form. And in fact, it doesn't use, um, it isn't sort of unique in the sense that you can have two elliptic curves that look like this uh, with different A and B, and they would actually be isomorphic. So this isn't a unique model for a particular elliptic curve. Um, so A, B, um, and say d to the fourth a and d to the sixth b um, they, for any invertible d here uh, would give us isomorphic elliptic curves. Um, so actually that already tells us that if we want uh, we can take our a and b to be integers and not rational numbers um, which will make our lives a little bit easier and in particular, this isn't. This is really an integral model for an elliptic curve. Um, so really, this tells us a little bit more than just an elliptic curve. It gives us an actual integral model this way. Okay, and um, if a and b are as small as possible but integers, um, then the elliptic curve is called minimal. Um, just to note, so definition, um, if uh, you have a and b and integers, and if, say, p to the fourth divides a, then p to the sixth doesn't divide b for all primes p, then uh, this elliptic curve, this integral model, is a minimal model. Okay, and so today the, our goal is to study integral points on these models. And I'll just say integral points on elliptic curves uh, for simplicity. Okay, um, and so we may have thought about points on elliptic curves before in different ways. So we might have thought about complex points. Um, which is something we understand pretty well. Uh, real points, we also understand pretty well. So a complex point, you get a torus. Real points, you get the, the sort of usual pictures. Um, you know, it looks like this or that. Um, and then in the previous talks, we've spent a lot of time talking about the rational points, um, which we know are finitely generated abelian group. So they look like some z to some power, which we call the rank of the elliptic curve, um, plus some torsion part. 
Um, and here, um, no matter which model, which integral model you choose, that doesn't affect the complex points or the real points or the rational points here. Um, it really just depends on the isomorphism class of the elliptic curve. Um, that, that will tell us uh, what the, say, rational points look like. Okay. And we've seen in previous talks that this uh, rank here is something that is not very well understood still. Um, and there, lots of, there are lots of heuristics and um, models for trying to understand the rank. But the torsion is very well understood. Um, at least over Q, we know exactly the options for torsion. Um, and we know that it happens very rarely. Uh, all of them happen very rarely compared to just having no torsion or trivial torsion. Okay. Um, and then today, we really want to spend our time talking about integral points. So here, I'm going to just put the a, b here because the model is important. Okay. So what I mean by the integral points here are, well, exactly what you would think, which is I want solutions x, y um, to this equation. Okay. Um, now, unlike in the previous cases where we're asking for the points over a field, the complex numbers, the real numbers, or the rational numbers, here we're asking for these integral points, there's not going to be a group law. Okay, um, so you know there's not as much structure on these integral points, um, and the other thing to notice is it really depends on the integral model that we've chosen. Um, I've said this a few times, but it really depends on the a and b, and not just the isomorphism class of the elliptic curve. So, for example, if you take a b versus d to the fourth d to the sixth d to the fourth a d to the sixth b as as your model, um, you can see that this the model with the extra d's could have a lot more integral points. Okay, it has all, sort of all of the previous ones scaled up and it could have even more. So it won't be consistent um, based on, you know, the model in that sense. And then in, in particular, you won't, um, uh, you won't have the same number uh, if you use different models always. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just comment here that, um, we can generalize a lot of this that I'm going to talk about to number fields, K, um, and integral points in number fields, um, say EAB of OK, where OK is the ring of integers of K. And in fact, you can generalize this further to S integral points, um, where S is a finite set of primes. So we can talk about EAB of say OKS, the S integers of the of the number field. Okay, so I'm not going to say too much about this, but pretty much everything I say can be generalized um, to these uh, cases. Okay, um, so our the main question that we want to think about is how many integral points are there? Um, this is similar to our previous uh, talks where we're talking about how many rational points are there on an elliptic curve. Um, and then we realize that that, uh, that question about rational points really comes down to understanding, well, torsion we understand. And so then it becomes uh, a question about what the rank of an elliptic curve would look like. Um, and here, uh, if we're asking how many integral points do we have, You can ask this question in several different ways. You can ask, hey, if I give you an, an, an uh, elliptic curve, um, can you tell me all the integral points on it? Um, this is not terribly hard uh, for small elliptic curves, of course. It obviously gets a lot more difficult for um, larger elliptic curves um, with larger height or larger coefficients. Um, but if we were able to understand the rational points, then certainly we're able to compute the integral points. Um, but um, it's actually somehow much easier because there's work of Mordell. Well, it's often called Siegel's theorem, but I think for elliptic curves is actually proved by Mordell, um, which says that, well, there are actually only finitely many integral points no matter what. So even if the rank is positive, even if there are infinitely many rational points, there are only going to be finitely many integral points. Okay? But um, maybe it's important to point out that this is not effective. This, I mean, this doesn't tell us how many 
finitely many means. It could be a million for all we know for an arbitrary elliptic curve. Okay. Um, and then, as I said before, we won't get a uniform bound. Um, so if we have finitely many, maybe we're looking for an upper bound, but it's not possible to get a uniform bound in general, meaning I won't be able to say there are no elliptic curves with more than a million integral points. And that's because of the issue with the scaling that I mentioned earlier. So if you scale um, you know, your equation uh, by d to the fourth here and d to the sixth there, so d to the fourth a and d to the sixth b, you can produce a lot more integral points. Um, so you can, you can think that even with um, you know, some bound for minimal uh, elliptic curves, you might not get a uniform bound for all integral models. Um, okay, and then you might ask, okay, well, what do we expect to happen, right? We already know from, especially from um, some of the previous uh, talks, that it's pretty hard to find rational points. Um, th this idea of the minimalist conjecture that was mentioned before says that, well, rational points are hard to find, so if there's no real reason for them to be there, there won't be any extra, or we don't expect extra. And the same is true for integral points. I mean, integral points are even more special than rational points. They should be, they should be even harder to find. Um, so we expect, perhaps, integral points to be rare. OK. Um, and so then you can ask, well, what about in av on average? Or what's the distribution like? So if you look at a whole family of elliptic curves, you know, on average, under some ordering, how many integral points do you expect there to be? Okay. So this is, as these elliptic curves vary in some family. Oops, sorry. Um, Way, is the writing still coming out? It's coming on my side. Something yeah, yeah. seems odd here. I apologize. Um, let me try to reshare this. Okay. Is that okay? okay. Yeah, that's, that's much yep. better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Okay. Um, okay, so as um, your elliptic curves vary in some family, um, you need some ordering of this family as we've seen in previous talks. Um, you could ask how, you know, how many integral points are there on average or what is the distribution of your integral points? Okay. Um, and in fact, we know some things about this. Uh, so we have some information. So, okay, we know that, well, if the elliptic curve has rank zero, then it won't have any rational points in general. Um, so 100% of rank zero elliptic curves uh, have no rational points at all, and so they should have no integral points. Okay, well, when I say no rational points other than the identity, but the identity uh, does not count as an integral point. Okay, um, and that's because we know that torsion is very rare um, and that 100% of elliptic curves under a reasonable ordering like height or something like that, uh, which we've seen in other talks, but I'll define again shortly, um, have no torsion, have just trivial torsion. So they won't have any integral points. Um, and um, Alpogay uh, proved in 2014 that 100% of rank one elliptic curves have very few uh, integral points. In particular, they have less than or equal to two integral points. Um, and two is really the, the 
minimum other than none at all that you could get to because uh, integral points were common pairs, right? You can just take y, y to minus y, and then you have um, a reflection unless, unless it's torsion. Okay, so already we know that rank zero and rank one elliptic curves should have very few integral points. And if you believe the things of the previous talks, we would say that 100% of elliptic curves should have rank zero or one. That should mean 100% of rank zero or one, which is, oh, it should be 100% all elliptic curves, um, should have less than or equal to two integral points. Um, and maybe if, I mean, if you don't quite believe those heuristics yet, at least we know from work of Bhargava and Shankar, um, that 80% of elliptic curves have rank zero or one, at least 8%. Okay, so that means that at least 80% of elliptic curves have uh, fewer than two integral points, or less than or equal to two uh, integral points, okay? Um, but this doesn't answer the question of averages. This does tell us something about the distribution of um, it, the number of integral points as you vary over elliptic curves. Um, this doesn't tell us that the average is bounded, for example, because you could still have some very small set of curves. The remaining 20% of elliptic curves could have tons of points um, and an unbounded, you know, huge number of points. So um, this, um, you know, this doesn't quite answer the question uh, that we posed up here. Um, but it does give us um, some sense that we should not have many integral points. And in fact, I mean, I think most of us believe that, well, we do have 100% of rank zero and rank one elliptic curves and that they should each have no integral points whatsoever. Okay. All right. Um, and so you could ask also about records. Um, Uh, so, uh, no, Malky, uh, in an email to me um, in October of 2018, uh, when I was uh, at, uh, visiting Harvard, told me that the largest number that he knows about for any elliptic curve in minimal form, the uh, largest number of integral points on an elliptic curve, So minimal Weierstrass form, minimal elliptic curve, um, is uh, five six two zero. This is two times twenty eight ten, and this curve has rank twenty five. Okay, um, I don't I don't think he did an exhaustive search necessarily. He, I mean, maybe he's here and can speak to this, um, but we can ask also then. Um, are there minimal elliptic curves with more integral points? And how would you find them? Presumably you want to look for ones with large rank, but that's, that's not even um, clear. Okay. So I, I don't think um, that's been a, a heavily studied question. All right, and then you can ask about bounds. Uh, for uh, the number of integral points, right? We know it's a finite number, um, and over the years, people have studied um, how to bound this number in many different ways. So I'll just mention a few uh, of the better bounds that we know in, um, of different shapes. But as I said, lots of people have worked on this over the years. Um, so there's work of Helfcott and Van Katesh in 2006 um, that shows that the number of integral points is bounded by O of one to the omega of the discriminant log of the size of the discriminant squared times 1.33 rank of the elliptic curve. Okay, um, here uh, omega is just the number of distinct prime factors of the discriminant.
Okay, um, so as you can see, this bound is dependent on sort of the complexity, the number of prime factors of your discriminant, the size of the discriminant. Um, and so those shouldn't, maybe shouldn't be too surprising, those things are involved, and the rank, um, also not so surprising that might affect the number of integral points, right? As I said before, if you're looking for re records for the number of integral points, largest number of integral points, you might want to look for large rank elliptic curves. Um, if you have more rational points, you have a better chance of getting integral points in a very naive sense. Okay, so these kind of um, things, these kind of objects coming up in uh, the bounds is not so surprising. Uh, there's also work, uh, maybe I won't write out all the names, uh, Bhargava, Shankar, Taniguchi, Thorne, Zimmerman, Zhao. Um, and this is in 2017. Uh, this bounds number of integral points in terms of, oops, sorry. the discriminant to some power. One, 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 seven. Okay, and these, these kind of bounds um, have been in the literature for a while where uh, one tries to bound the number of integral points um, with respect to the discriminant to some power, and that power has um, improved over time. Um, so I think the most, the health god Venkatesh also had um, a bound of this form, um, and this more recent work does improve on that. And it also builds on uh, work of Brumer and Kramer. Okay, um, there are other sorts of bounds. So I would say this may have started with Silverman's thesis um, in 1987. Um, and the bound is a slightly different shape than we've seen. Uh, it's O of one uh, to the one plus rank of the elliptic curve um, times one plus something I'll denote omega SS of the discriminant. Um, and what that omega SS means here, this is the number of primes of bad multiplicative reduction for the elliptic curve. But if you don't know what that means, that's really just you take the J invariant of the elliptic curve and you look at the number of primes in its denominator when it's simplified. something very easily computable. Okay. Um, again, it, has, it's, it does tell you something about the complexity of the discriminant elliptic curve. Um, and um, this, uh, this was only for a minimal model, for minimal model elliptic curves. Um, in work with Hindry, Silverman also uh, has a slightly different type of bound, um, which involves something called the spiral ratio. So it looks a little bit, it looks similar um, to this previous uh, bound. So there's a O of one to the one plus rank of E, and then there's something called the spiral ratio. So it's often denoted uh, let's say sigma, okay, uh, the sigma here is given by um, the log of the discriminant, essentially, divided by the log of the conductor, so NE is the conductor. Um, but the important thing to notice here, actually, um, which may not be well known, is that the spiral ratio, the sigma, is conjectured to be uh, bounded. ABC, in fact, implies that this is always bounded um, by six plus little o of one. So if we knew ABC, we'd know that um, the spiral ratio is bounded. And this is also for minimal models. Okay, and so if you believe ABC here, right, then this is always bounded, the sigma here. And if you believe boundedness of ranks, which some people in the audience may believe, uh, especially nowadays, uh, then this term is also bounded, okay? So this entire exponent would be bounded, which would give a uniform bound actually here. But again, it's for minimal models only, which it's possible to have a uniform bound for minimal models. So um, this maybe comments that if you believe ABC, 
plus uh, boundedness of ranks. That would give a uh, uniform bound for the number of integral points. Okay. Um, all right, and um, maybe I'll just comment quickly that to know David um, has improvements on uh, both of these bounds. Um, so uh, they, it looks more like O of one, um, say here, O of one to the one plus rank um, times something that's linear in the log of this term. And, and one plus rank here, and something that's linear in the log of this term. So actually significant improvements in that sense. But regardless, um, I haven't told you what these O of ones are. So for the people that aren't analytic number theorists, um, you know, this just, when I'm writing O of one, I'm just saying it's a constant, but I haven't told you anything about what the constant is. And in fact, in all of these cases, the constants are very, very big. Okay, so often like on the order of say 10 to the 10. So, okay, we get, Possibly, if you, you know, believe all these things, we do get some sort of bound, but it's a very big bound. If this is something like 10 to the 10, you know, and this is um, something like 22, and this is something like 6, it's still a very big number. Okay, and, yep. Now, um, wait, there's a question in the chat wondering yep. what the constants depend on. Um, the, uh, these constants don't depend on anything uh, mm -hmm. in, in these formulas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and maybe um, maybe if I could just go back to an earlier question in the chat from Bjorn, uh, yep. was uh, wondering uh, whether this this um, this record setting integral point elliptic curve does it actually been proven to have rank twenty five not larger and to have no more than that number of points, um, and you know how close does it get to these bounds? I might add. Okay, um, I actually don't know the answer to that, Bjorn. Um, I, I don't know if Noam is here, but he would be the person to ask about that particular. I, don't, I actually don't even know what elliptic curve it is. Um, I, in, if you look at my notes that were posted online, I did a little uh, copy paste of his what I got from his email. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know if it's actually, um, but he says it's a, for a curve of rank 25. So I'm guessing it's prov provably rank 25 in that case. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's just 5,000 some, uh, 5,620, which is nowhere near uh, what mm -hmm. these bounds would give. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so these constants are very big. And um, I mean, personally, you know, I was hoping um, to prove statistical results uh, as we've seen earlier in the series of talks, in the sense of, uh, can we prove something about the average about, of the number of integral points, not necessarily things about specific um, elliptic curves, okay? And so if we wanna prove statistical results, um, maybe we can control this constant better. And the reason we thought that maybe controlling this constant better would help is that we actually have some control on things of the form small numbers to the rank of elliptic curves um, on average. Okay, and that's because of some of the results that have been mentioned in um, earlier talks about Selmer averages. I'll, I'll um, review them in a moment, but um, this gives us uh, some control over these kind of uh, ideas. So if you have a small number to the rank, uh, we have a chance of controlling that on average. Whereas here, this is a big number to something that involves a rank we don't have very much control over in general on average. Okay, so um, motivated by this, um, this is, uh, let me call this theorem one. Uh, so this is joint work uh, with Levent Apoge. Um, we found a bound for the number of integral points. Um, that just uses two as the you know bottom of that uh, 
expression. So instead of having that O of one that was huge, it's just gonna be two to the rank of the elliptic curve. And then there's some more uh, product here. So the product is over all primes P that divide the discriminant at least twice. Um, and then it's just a linear expression in the valuation, the piatic valuation of that discriminant. So it's four times the floor of the valuation divided by two plus one. Um, and you take this product over all such primes here. Okay. So the way I've written it, um, there is a constant buried in here, right? I wrote, wrote this symbol. Um, there is a constant there that is quite big. Um, it's on the order of 10 to the seventh, um, but it's only one such constant at least. It's not that constant raised to some high power. And here we have two to the rank um, and then some expression over here. Okay. Uh, maybe some comments. Uh, this can be improved um, if the valuation is very big. Uh, for example, this you could take the minimum of this expression and two times ten to the seventh. Um, so this could you could think of this as an O of one, but usually this is quite small. Really, uh, there aren't. I mean, for most elliptic curves, um, your discriminant is not going to have you know p to the a millionth dividing it for some prime p. So um, this does not get too big. Um, and you can act, you can improve on this in specific cases as well. Um, but um, so the idea here is that right this now becomes something that is perhaps a little bit easier to control. Um, and this, as I said, shouldn't be too big um, in general. Okay. Um, so I'll just remark here that one can generalize this theorem to uh, S integral points over number fields. Um, I'm not going to write it down, uh, but you still get a, something that looks like two to the rank of E of K, where K is that number field. So the um, K points, of course, are, are what are going to come into here. Um, you get a constant to the number of uh, places in your S, um, essentially. And then there's the two torsion of the class group of the number field is coming into play. Um, so again, this, I'm not going to write it down, but uh, you can get formulas like this, um, and it does generalize. OK. Um, but what I do want to focus on is um, you know, trying to uh, use this theorem to get to these statistical results. So I said, well, we have control on average of this. And I claim that we have control of this on average as well. Um, and so putting that together means that we should have control of this entire thing on average, okay? So let me write that down a little bit more slowly. So um, first, uh, we have this theorem uh, tells us that we can control the number of integral points Um, in terms of two to the rank, about two to the rank, okay? And then uh, the Selmer results that we have um, from work of Bhargava and Shankar, so starting in 2010, they tell us what the average size of Selmer groups are for N, uh, well, let's see, N is two, three, four, or five, and the average size of Selmer groups are three, four, seven, and six. Okay. Um, I mean, for the purposes of today, if I mean, I know Selmer groups were uh, discussed in the previous talks. Um, you can black box what a Selmer group is, except for certain facts that I, I will uh, use. In particular, um, the first fact that I'll use about Selmer groups is that they sit in an exact sequence. Um, here, I'll just do it for two. Um, so you get a map from uh, E of Q mod 2 E of Q to the two Selmer group, went up to curve, um, and then this uh, surjects onto the uh, two torsion part of the tate shaft ridge group. Okay, we'll use this exact sequence a little bit later. In particular, what we will use is the fact that this, uh, this part is an injection. Um, but this exact sequence tells us that two to the rank of the elliptic curve is bounded by the size of, well, E of Q mod 2 E of Q 
right? It's more or less the same as uh, the size of EFQ mod 2 EFQ up to torsion. Um, and then this, because it's an injection, uh, is bounded by the size of the Selmer group. Okay, so the fact that we have control over the average size of Selmer groups here um, means that we now have control of this, this two to the rank. So control on average of this gives us control of this. And hopefully that means we have some control over here. Okay, so combining this, these two uh, things with the idea that this also shouldn't get too big. So this product over uh, the primes, I won't write it out, uh, this shouldn't get too big. Okay, so combining these three ideas here um, gives us um, the idea that on average, the number of integral points should be bounded. Okay, so again, let me just review. What I'm saying is that uh, we have some control over this on average, um, because of the work of Bhargava and Shankar bounding Selmer groups. Uh, this being bounded on average is um, a standard sort of analytic number theory computation. Um, and then altogether, that means that on average, this entire thing should be bounded. Um, of course, it's not quite so simple. You can't exactly split up on average for the two parts of this product. Um, you do have to put in some, something about Holder's inequality. So there's a little bit of work there, but that's the main idea. And so the theorem that you get then, uh, let's call this theorem two. And this is also joint with Levent. Um, is that, well, let me name my family of elliptic curves. So we'll talk about all elliptic curves, um, EABs. with discriminant non-zero, of course, here. Okay, and we're gonna order them by height. And so the height of the elliptic curve here is basically the size of its coefficients. Okay, then the theorem is that um, actually the average number of elliptic uh, points on this elliptic curve okay uh, the average over this family is bounded but in fact it's a little bit stronger than that um, that i have this exponent t in here Okay, so in fact, it's not just the average. So if it was just the average, I, that would be where t equals one. Um, but I'm actually saying something a little bit stronger, which is the higher moments uh, where t can go up to about 2.3219 log base two of five, um, those, are, those moments are also bounded. Okay, and um, the reason for that, I mean, the idea is this uh, argument up here that uh, we've discussed, but the reason that we can do it for actually slightly more moments um, is because, well, actually, we didn't have to use two to the rank here. We could actually use five to the rank. We have some bound on the average five Selmer here. And it doesn't even matter what that, I mean, here, I mean, Bhargava Shankar's results, we, they give the actual average um, two Selmer, three Selmer, four Selmer, and five Selmer sizes for these families of elliptic curves. Um, but we actually, for this theorem, only need the fact that it's bounded. Um, and so the average five Selmer bound here tells us something about five to the rank here. And if you go back to our original theorem here, well, we had something about two to the rank, but that means two to the log, two to the rank, to the log base uh, two of five would also be bounded. So we can say something a little bit stronger. Okay. Um, so this theorem tells us that, you know, not only is the average bounded, but also some higher moments are of the number of integral points are bounded here. Um, 
let me just comment that this can be generalized to other number fields and S integral points also. Um, this five here, right here, is coming from the fact that we have a five Selmer bound. So if you knew something about the N Selmer group on average of elliptic curves, um, you could improve this to log base two of N. Um, and the average, uh, if T equals one, this average being bounded um, was proved uh, earlier by Levent himself um, in 2014 um, and also Do Young Kim in 2015. So um, the, the new work here is the, these higher moments. Um, you don't have to use this family here that I've defined. You can also use different types of families, like the family of all minimal elliptic curves or all semi-stable elliptic curves, or you can put on finitely many congruence conditions. You can tweak this um, quite a bit. You can also study families with marked points. Um, there are lots of other families that you get similar types of results for. Um, what it requires is actually understanding uh, the Selmer averages, um, as we saw. That, that is a crucial ingredient, and there aren't that many families there. It also is not automatic from understanding that. So it could be that there you have a family of curves where you have some information about the average three Selmer size, say, um, but the second part of the um, that, that product over all primes where p squared divides discriminant, that second part um, does not get bounded. Um, so it's not an automatic thing, but this does this theorem does apply to many other families as well. Okay. Um, so in the last 10 minutes, I uh, want to give an idea of the proof of theorem one. Um, hopefully the proof of theorem two is already a little bit clear the idea of what, what happens. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about how we proved theorem one um, because it's quite classical actually. Um, but before I get there, um, are there any questions that I can answer? It's going great, thank you. Okay, <laughs> just want to make sure. All right, um, so. Um, so the idea of the proof of theorem one, so theorem one was this bound that I gave, um, which involved two to the rank and some product um, that had to do with valuations of primes that divided the discriminant to high power. Okay. Um, the main idea of this actually comes from work of Mordell from 1969. Um, so Mordell uh, wrote this, and I don't know that that many people knew about it. And Translating into modern language actually makes it um, quite straightforward. Um, but he related integral points on elliptic curves. Um, well, he related them to binary quartic forms. In fact, he related them to binary quartic forms that represented one, which meant that they had integer solutions um, such that you plug it in, you plug in F, your binary quartic is F, and you plug in your integers into that, and it equals one. Um, in, but we don't have to use that language nowadays if we don't want to. Um, so let's just have a quick aside on binary quartics. Um, so the idea is that, you know, if you can represent integral points on elliptic curves by something else that we can control, um, then we have some, you know, control over the integral points as well. Okay, so a binary quartic form um, is just a polynomial in two variables, let's call it big X and big Y, uh, of degree four, homogeneous degree four. So I'll use coefficients A, B, C, D, E. Okay, um, and we're gonna just think about these things over Q. So all my coefficients are gonna be in Q for now. Um, there's some action of SL2, Q say, on here. Um, you can think of it as SL2 Q acting on SIM4 of Q squared if you want. The space of binary cortics, you can think of as SIM4 of a uh, two-dimensional space. And there's some polynomial invariants um, that this is all very classical. Uh, there's something called I and something usually called J. Um, so I, I can write out easily, is just degree two. J is something that's degree three. I won't write down the formula here. Um, 
But the point is that these two generate the entire ring of invariance. Okay, so the polynomial invariant ring is a polynomial ring generated by i and j. Okay, so these are the two that you, one has to think about when we think about the invariant theory of binary cortex. And there's also something called delta or the discriminant here, uh, which you can write in terms, well, you know you can write it in terms of um, the i and the j because it's an invariant as well. And despite that 27 in the denominator there, this does have integral coefficients in the a, b, c, d, and e. Um, and the important thing here is that there's a geometric interpretation of binary cortex that um, is used in a lot of uh, work related to elliptic curves. And the geometric interpretation is that if you have a binary cortex, um, let's say with discriminant not zero, this corresponds to, um, well, it's gonna to correspond to a double cover of P1 um, ramified at the four points where the binary cortex is zero, okay? I'm roughly saying this because of course the points aren't necessarily defined over Q, the roots of the binary cortex aren't necessarily defined over Q, um, but the binary cortex will give you um, the ramification locus of a double cover of uh, P1. So I'm gonna get a curve. In fact, it's gonna be genus one this way. And it comes with a degree two divisor or line bundle, whatever you prefer. Um, so we can write this down very explicitly, let me just say. Um, and there's, there are equivalences on both sides that I'll mention in a second. Um, so we can write down the curve just as z squared equals f of x to y, essentially. Okay, so this gives me a double cover of the, um, play, of the projective line. Um, and it turns out that this, you know, is a genus one curve. And it has um, a degree two divisor line bundle by the fact that it's a double cover of the projective line. Okay, and in fact, you can write down the Jacobian of this uh, curve. So the Jacobian of a genus one curve is an elliptic curve. And so I can write it down in a short Weierstrass form if I want um, by using I and J, the invariance here. Okay. There is some equivalence on um, both sides. Um, if you wanna be precise, this is some sort of twisted PGL2Q action. Um, and then it's isomorphisms on the right-hand side. Um, to make this go through. So to go from a binary cortic form, uh, you can just write down the curve that you get and then the line bundle or the divisor just comes from the fact that you have a map to P1. Um, and then to go backwards, you take uh, your curve, um, which has a map to P1 because of the divisor. So you have your C and your LSA and you have a map to P1 and then you just compute the ramification locus of that double cover. So that would be the reverse map. Okay. And then the key idea here um, is that there's a key example of this, which is if you take your curve here to be just your elliptic curve E, A, B. So a genus one curve um, doesn't necessarily have to be an elliptic curve. It only elliptic curve if it has a rational point, but it, you, might as, you could take E, A, B to be your genus one curve. You could take your divisor, here, your degree two divisor to be O plus P for some point P. Um, so let's call it X naught, Y naught is the point P. And let's make it a rational point, though it doesn't really matter. Then you can compute um, this explicitly, this F that corresponds to this uh, situation. And the, you know, you can see that X naught, Y naught, and A are involved um, in this expression. Okay. Um, and this essentially gives the map that we talked about earlier. So we saw a map earlier from E of Q mod 2 E of Q uh, into the Selmer group, the two Selmer group of your elliptic curve. And it turns out that you can think of elements of the two Selmer group as, well, more or less binary cortex. Some sort of special binary cortex, not all of them, but 
they're going to be locally soluble uh, binary cortex. So there's some, there's some extra condition here. So this gives a way to go from a rational point to a binary cortex, which is sitting inside the two Selmer group here. Okay. And this is the key idea of Mordell, which is that actually, you know what? We don't even have to take a rational point. We could take an integral point. Okay, so if we take an integral point here, we're still going to be able to map over to here. An integral point is going to be a rational point. And we can map all the way into the two Selmer group here. Okay, and so Mordell finds um, essentially um, explicit formulas for the kind of binary cortex that come up when you look at integral points over here. So we exactly understand which binary cortex come up as the image of integral points on this side. Okay, and then that ends up being the idea that we use. Um, so I'll just sort of summarize that we have this picture. Let's call this composition map psi. We have a map from E of Z to E of Q. Well, if I want to be precise, right, um, this is really, I need to record the integral model here. And this maybe I can write, I'll write a scripty to say, I'm taking the elliptic curve without thinking about the model here. Okay, and now I'm just copying the map from before. And then there's an injection into the two Selmer group here. But again, I want to think of this as binary cortex, special binary cortex. Okay. And so we know, so there's a formula that says that if we have a point here, oh, something. Stop um, sharing? Yeah, stop sharing. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Um, so if we have a point on uh, this side here, um, we can write down the binary cortex over here from this formula. Um, and so the idea is then that, well, we know uh, what the size of this is from earlier, we said that the size of this is more or less two to the rank. Well, it could be four times two to the rank if there's some torsion, some two torsion. So this is bounded by four times two to the rank of the elliptic curve. And this is an injection here, okay? So if we look at this entire map, that means that the image of this map, the size of the image is bounded by four times two to the rank of the elliptic curve. And then um, the fibers are what you have to deal with here, the fibers of this map. How many uh, you know, uh, points here will land on the same binary cortex over here? And that turns out to be not that many. Um, and that's that product overall primes P that divides the discriminant at least twice. Um, that's where that factor comes up. So I'll just write it down quickly. So the fiber of psi turns out to be bounded um, by th that product. Um, and that's where we get the, this theorem. So we just try to understand um, this, you know, this particular map of sending uh, integral points to binary cortex over here. Okay. So I'll stop there um, and happy to take any questions at this point. Thanks. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Let's see, are there any questions from the audience? So when you're dealing with the fibers of this map, are there parts of that that are, are more difficult than others? We've got these three steps here. Um, here with these fibers at this, this last bit. Yeah, so is it all in the... Um, so the, I, the idea of this ends up being using um, sort of Diophantine approximation ideas. Um, mm -hmm. So we end up, we're very lucky that a lot of people proved a lot of wonderful theorems that we can just use. Um, and so um, basically there's work of Bambieri Schmidt and Everts, Everts, I always pronounce that incorrectly, sorry, um, that uh, tell us that there are not many solutions to uh, 2A equations. So things mm -hmm. that look like f of x, y equals one. 
there aren't many solutions to that. And that's more or less what we have to count um, in, in this. Um, in some sense, uh, the, the size of the fibers has to do with the difference between SL2Z and PGL2Q, um, mm -hmm. which is, so uh, when, uh, if, you, if you look at exactly how the correspondence um, goes for Merdell um, between integral points and uh, binary cortex that represent one, there's some SL2Z action there. But when we talk about actual Selmer groups, um, there's an action that I mentioned that has to do with PGL2Q. Um, so mm -hmm. it ends up being that difference that uh, really comes up here, mm -hmm. fundamentally. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Well, great. So uh, we'll meet again in two weeks on October 27th. And the speaker that day is Arul Shankar talking about ordering elliptic curves by conductor. Okay, and let's thank Weiho again. <laughs>